interviewing Harry uh, this morning and um, to ask him some of his questions about his uh, latest book and about his uh, publishing uh, process. So, um, Harry, if you wouldn't mind just uh, starting off, uh, giving us a little bit of a teaser about uh, uh, about your latest book. Uh, okay, the, the, the latest is it's called The Strange Death of Fiona Griffiths. Um, it's the third in a series that I've been writing for a while and I'm continuing with. Um, she's she's a young Welsh detective, works in Cardiff, and that's not really the USP. The USP is she's a very unusual person. The whole thing is written first person in her voice. Um, kind of the biggest thing to know about her in a way is that uh, she had a breakdown when she was a teenager when she suffered from a real-life condition called Cotard syndrome. She had full-blown Cotard syndrome. And in Cotard syndrome, the sufferer believes themselves to be dead. So she's a detective who spent two years thinking she was a dead person. And she's kind of got an interesting relationship with corpses and an interesting outlook on life, let's put it that way. It sounds absolutely amazing. Wow. Um, written in the first person, that's quite interesting. How did that work? Yeah, well... <clears throat> I mean, I, I get the question that I'm asked most actually is, "Wow, you're writing in the first person as a woman. Don't you think that's kind of hard?" And I'm kind of thinking, actually, you know, I'm married to a woman. Yeah. I know quite a lot of women. There are quite a lot of women in the world. Surely the question is, "You're writing in the voice of somebody who used to think they were dead." <laughs> isn't isn't that the kind of isn't isn't that the kind of bigger trick? Um, I mean, in the end. Writing fiction is make believe, and you know if you're good at it, then you should be able to to make believe, and you should be able, to, you know, if you're capable of writing a historical character, you should, of course, you should be able to write as as a woman or a man or yeah. you know, people with sort of weird conditions. And what I will say is, although this woman is very very different from me, and she has a very sort of strong, very emphatic voice of her own, I've never felt more comfortable writing anything. So quite what. I mean, I'm a relatively normal middle-aged guy, and she is um, a very unusual younger woman, and yet I click when I'm writing her. So what that says about me, I don't know. And it's the third in the series. Um, how many predicted to go? Or, or... Well, um, I, there, there, there isn't a prediction. I would think we're looking at 10 to 12, something like that. I mean, I'm contracted to write six for Orion in this country, but there'll certainly be more after that. Yeah, yeah. No, the most striking thing uh, instantly when I see the book, uh, I must say the cover looks absolutely stunning. And could you tell me a little bit more about how you went about that? Or, or, or... Okay, well, but it's, it's, it's a slightly more complicated because I'm published all over the world. So, so th this stuff is, is published in Britain, in France, in Germany, in, in Spain, in Italy, in America, and other places too. Now, every publisher in their own market chooses their own cover, and Orion in the UK has got a very, very strong look for the books. So it's it's kind of black, black and grey and neon, and you know it definitely jumps off the shelves, and you can definitely recognise that there's a series of books going on there. Um, in the US, I was being published with Random House, which is obviously you know the largest publisher in the world, and I had a terrific editor there, so that my editor at Random House was the same person who publishes Lee Child, um, and they had their cover look for the book that was fine, but not really stand out, I don't think. Then for various reasons that I, I dare say we'll get into, I ended up self-publishing in the US. So whereas I'm conventionally published everywhere else, um, in the US I'm self-publishing, and I, I commissioned that cover myself. Um, and the cover for the book, I, I went to an outfit called 99 Designs, um, where you can kind of put the design out to a large group of designers, and people compete, they, they compete for a prize that you offer. And you can look at literally dozens. I mean, I actually looked at hundreds of designs. Now, if you ditch the ones that were not that good quality, um, you're probably looking at dozens. But uh, but I was looking at dozens of real quality designs, any of which could have graced the cover of you know any, any one of my books. Um, and I think the one that I ended up picking was it, it's basically an upside down tree viewed through a sort of rainy pane of glass, and it's very striking. It works really well in thumbnail. And it's different, you know, it doesn't look like everything else there. And when, given that readers are looking at, you know, pages of different Amazon thumbnails when they're sort of figuring out what next to buy, it had to work particularly well in that smaller size. Yeah, yeah, sure. Now, as you say, it's, it's your publishing story is really fascinating. And um, it's something I'd, I'd love to get onto with this. So 
you said, I mean, you're, you're clearly published with uh, many traditional houses around the world. Now, this one's uh, partly self-published as well. And so, well, firstly, I guess a congratulations on that. How is it going? How are you finding the process? The, the self-pub process? Yeah. Yeah, well, it, it's early days. Um, it's early days. Um, the, the, the sort of minimal th threshold for me was I wanted to be able to publish the book properly, commission a good cover design, um, do, do some copy editing work, uh, get the book properly formatted. So, so there are kind of costs associated with all of that, and I used proper professionals. I wasn't using a friend of my brother's who knows something about Photoshop. Um, and by putting the book, making the book available for sale before launch, uh, I built up a, a kind of hundreds of pre-orders, and the result was that basically on the day of publication, I had paid off all my costs, so what I'm looking at now is how much money I make. Um, and I don't know, I mean, the, the, the wheel is still in spin. Um, it's selling 20 or 30 copies a day. Um, I'd like it to be selling, you know, two or three times that in due course. But one of the things about self-publishing is, you know, readers don't care when a book was published. They, they, whereas in the print market, basically you're only on the shelves of a retailer in any prominent position for maybe three or four weeks. So, so that early window is everything for a regular publisher. Um, and thereafter, outside that window, you effectively get very, very little support from your traditional publisher. Um, if you're self-publishing a book yourself, th there is no window. The, the book is eternal, and if, you know, if I completely neglected the book for a year and then really started to put some kind of marketing energy behind it, no one would, would particularly care. So it, it is early days. I'm not attaching too much significance to that early window. And at the moment, things are going fine. Yeah, you seem to have written um, essentially that, you know, we put the book out there and let's see what happens. That's quite a striking attitude in a way, I think, uh, for, 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 for many other authors. Uh, in, in, in the I, sense of that, um, you know, you've written a lot in, in, your, in your blog post recently about publishing, how some books are very, very successful and some books can be published well and can be great books but don't work at all. And so your attitude seems to be, um, you, you know, one can do only so much, or that uh, there are so many complex forces at play. Yeah, to, 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 to give it some background, I mean, I, I've been more or less a full-time writer for 15 years or more. Um, and, and in that time, I, I mean, not, not boasting, but just to sort of, you know, say that I have had significant relationships with significant publishers, I'm probably now on my fifth six-figure book deal yeah. with a conventional UK publisher. So I've, I've played the big game with some big boys. And, and as you know from my blogs, some of those things have worked out really well. Um, some of them have been absolute car crashes. So there is no certainty in this game. And there isn't certainty in, I mean, if you have a relationship with a conventional publisher, you will get your advance. If it says in black and white, you will get X thousand pounds, you will get that money. So, so in that sense, there is certainty from traditional publishing. But the sales outcome is really a, a total unknown. And I've had some absolute car crashes in traditional publishing, in, including instances where I'm certain that I could have sold more copies of the book myself than via a traditional publisher. Um, so there's just a kind of roulette wheel quality to the game, no matter whether you self-publish or conventionally publish. And of course, one of the beauties of self-publishing is A, you retain control, B, um, you can, if the first thing doesn't work and the second thing doesn't work, you can go on to the third thing and the fourth thing. It, it never runs out like that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, at, at this stage, I'm relaxed, definitely. Yeah. No, I mean, you say about retaining control. You mean it in terms of um, financial control and creative control, or, or what's more important to you? Just in that everything. I mean, um, certainly the book cover. Um, if I started to get as it happens, I've got neg very positive feedback on the book cover, but supposing I were to get negative feedback from readers on the cover, heck, I could just change it. I wouldn't have to be lobbying my publisher to do it, and my publisher would be intensely resistant um, because of the costs involved. Um, or, or if I needed to rewrite the ending, I could do that. Or if I decided, actually, you know what, I'm going to slash the price and put it out for free or for 99 cents on BookBub, um, I, I can do that, and I can go on tweaking things whenever I want. Again, one of the big tools, I think, in online promotion of any sort is email lists. Conventional publishers, I really have no idea why, make very little use of those things. 
um, with every book I'm selling, I'm asking people, I'm inviting people, I said, if you enjoyed this, add your name to my email list. I'm not going to, you know, fill you full of corporate nonsense, but a couple of times a year you'll get an email from me telling you that a book is coming out. Um, and if you'd like to buy that book, then terrific. And it's those sort of things that, you know, I can do, I can, I can adjust my strategy, and I don't have to go through some kind of complicated corporate process to, to make those things happen. And the truth is, an author is largely outside that corporate process, so that an, ability, an author's ability to impact those things with a conventional publisher is pretty restricted. Yeah, I think that's. I think you're entirely right, and also a lot of what we've been trying to create here at Reedy is to make that process uh, easier and and to be uh, launching several collaborative tools, which are hopefully going to make the whole uh, process of creating the book so much easier, so that authors can edit and have that flexibility um, and 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 do it as they. Yeah, yeah it, no, exactly. I, I mean, I think there's you know at the, at the moment there, there are three groups of authors, aren't there? Um, that there are conventionally published authors who are just completely happy with the way things are, and absolutely fine. Um, there are kind of indie types who relish the process of designing covers and editing manuscripts, and, and, and they like the kind of entrepreneurial quality of all of that. But th then there's definitely a, a group in the middle where, where they kind of think, yeah, logic says self-publish, but they don't know how to put the whole package together, and you know there will be services like yours that offer to integrate those in a pretty simple way so that so, so that, that kind of blockage for, that, that is stopping some people making the leap w will become smaller. It will never become zero, but it, it could become smaller. Yeah, I think that's an interesting point, um, that actually many of those who are, who are halfway in between several just need to be able to have access to the, the people that can help them with the stuff they don't want to or don't enjoy or aren't good at doing. Um, all those ones who are sort of not entirely entrepreneurial, but you know, yet can do some things by themselves. Um, yes. Yeah, and and people will have have their different kind of pinch points for all of it. I've been in the books game long enough that none of it was really very kind of complicated for me or, or, or very worrying. So I was perfectly happy to do really everything by myself. But but you know, outsourcing wherever I thought actually you know more about this and you can do it quicker and faster and cheaper than I can. Um, but yeah, not, not everyone has had my kind of experience. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, apart from the, of course, the, the reasons that you mentioned in terms of flexibility and having your own control and the options, is, uh, is that really what lies behind your excitement for, as you, as you call sort of the current era uh, of publishing? Is that really the, the biggest part of it or is there more? Um, in, in terms of how you yeah. think you develop in the next uh, well I think I, I think that sometimes there has been I, th I think often enough big publishers have taken their authors for granted because yeah sure they compete for them at that really early stage when a literary agent takes a book out for auction there is a basically checkbook based auction for that manuscript and that author but once that deal has been done it's pretty rare for authors to jump publisher unless something has gone badly wrong which means I think all th the publishers can take their authors a little bit for granted, and you know some of the treatment I've had has been very very good indeed. Um, some of the treatment I've had from publishers has been not so good, and there's never been a meaningful alternative, really, for to, to those sort of big five type publishers for a certain sort of book, the sort of books that I write, and just the existence now of self pub, which really you know, only is going to work for genre type authors. It's not going to work for literary fiction. At, at any rate, not yet. There's no sign yet of it working for literary fiction. But for genre type authors, we now, for the first time, have a meaningful alternative to just going with a regular publisher. And that's not to say that we want to stop, cut all ties with publishers, but it does mean that there is kind of some other presence in the room at the negotiation table. It's like, I don't have to take your offer. I do have an alternative, and that has really not been present before. And I think that's a, just a fabulous, a fabulous thing for all authors, whether they take the, the, the take the self-publishing route or whether they don't. It's just great that that the, the big publishers know that option does exist. Yes, and I, I agree. I mean, from your position as well, it's interesting because you've already established yourself uh, over many years as an author with traditional houses. Your your position, your route to going to self-publishing means that. You, you already have a name behind you, and I think also it'd be interesting to see what um, 
uh, authors who have never published before and who go straight into a form of self-publishing, how they establish their name in that is really interesting to me. Yes, uh, and, and I think the, the emerging model of successful self-publishing is, is, first of all, you need to be probably a genre author. Secondly, you need to be quite prolific. And third, you basically need to apply the write, publish, repeat model. Um, it's possible, but not likely, that your first book just becomes a big viral hit. But let, let's face it, look, loads of notes of good books never become viral hits. Even though in principle they could, it just doesn't happen. And, and no one will ever really be able to trace the reason why it doesn't happen. In fact, the rule is that it doesn't happen, it's just that occasionally it does. Yeah. So um, the, the, the write, publish, repeat model just says you, it, it's incremental. You, you, you get a readership this big with your first one, that big with your second one, and, and it grows from that. And you know, jumping from traditional publishing to self-publishing, yep, sure, I've got more interest in my books and more kind of book reviews and so on than I would have otherwise. But it's still, in many ways, this is I'm creating my email list from scratch, and that will just take time to build. And and those other things will take time to build too. Yeah, no, I think you're entirely right. And back, that's that's true. But also back to the the marketing of being able to have all these uh, books online which don't disappear means that. It's quite exciting to be able to bring back older ones in a much easier way. A uh, book you published some years previously could suddenly um, find an audience which they'd not previously had, and that you. Well, I mean, I with with my, so my first book, The Money Makers, was published in the UK in 2000. I never sold the US rights, um, and I never sold the ebook rights because nobody sold ebook rights back in 2000. So um, I retained rights to that book, and I no longer, in fact, had a TypeScript. I no, no longer had the manuscripts of it because I've been through multiple computers since then. I sent the, you know, hard copy of the book off to a place in London that scans these things for a tenor. They send me back a Word document that has some typos and stuff, so it needs kind of careful copy editing and going through. But for ten pounds and a day of my time, I had a TypeScript of my original manuscript, popped it up online in the, you know, Amazon.co.uk, Amazon.com. And I make from that one book alone uh, a couple of hundred quid a month. Now, a couple of hundred quid a month is, you know, it, it's it's not astonishing money, but hey, it's a couple of hundred quid a month yeah. that I wasn't getting otherwise. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, exactly. You can go your your content goes so much further, and that's really exciting. Um, and in terms of how how are you uh, engaging in I or in back to your self publishing. Uh, marketing efforts, how are you engaging with other online communities or other, is your approach in terms of your, your, your marketing presence online, how are you going about that? And you say, uh, interesting question. Yeah. Sorry. There's kind of an infinite amount of stuff that one could do and I think that um, there is very relatively little evidence to suggest that Facebook and Twitter and that kind of thing is really a strong way of promoting books. There'll be exceptions to every rule, but most books I don't think achieve many sales like that. I have a couple of books related websites. There's, there's a writer's workshop which helps kind of first time writers with their skills, and Agent Hunter which helps writers find literary agents. Now, between those two platforms, I've got websites that have traffic of uh, 70, 80,000 visitors a month. Um, and I've got a mailing list mailing lists of probably um, 15 to 20,000 names. All of these people are writers, but therefore also presumably interested in reading books, quite possibly by the person you know who runs the company that they've got an interest in. Um, I've used those things a bit, but not much. I don't expect to get significant sales from them. It's partly I don't want to contaminate those brands, but it's also I just think people don't like being marketed at and the online platforms that work well work where there's a really natural synchronicity between people's interests and in coming to the site and the product you're developing. So that means you know if you like being active on Goodreads, for example, that seems to me a really natural way to spend time. I don't particularly enjoy it. That means I'm never going to be that committed to it. That means that's probably not the right marketing route for me. But I think there are no general rules here. It really depends on each author and their own personal preferences and their own particular book and what 
kind of existing digital presence they have. Yes, I mean, remaining true to themselves, I guess. Um, exactly. Sorry, sorry, say again. Remaining true to themselves in terms of yes, what you like them in terms of. You can't of... fake it, can you? I mean, if if there are people who enjoy Twitter. There, there are people who actually enjoy engaging in Twitter, and those people will post several times a day, and they'll engage in conversations, and they'll make Twitter friends, and then when they do have something to market, they actually have a community of people who feel they're not just being kind of exploited for their wallets. They are, are as it were, Twitter friends, and, and have been over the months and the years. Now, I'm just not like that. I hate Twitter. Um, I use it as little as I can. Um, I do pump stuff out then now and again because I kind of think I have to but it's never going to be a strong channel for me and it, it just isn't yeah yeah no I think, I think you know but most people would be able to relate to, to one or other of those positions and as I was, you know it's not only Twitter there's also Facebook there's also Goodreads that there are other online communities of every sort and yeah and, and new ones which will develop I'm sure in the future I think that's what's the beauty of, 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 of publishing as well is that so many thousands of different types of authors um, will find so many different types of routes uh, routes to market, not just through you know various distribution channels, but the ways that they can, um, as you say, they can create a closer fit with certain online communities. And if it's general ones such as Facebook, which doesn't perhaps engage with your writers, uh, excuse me, your readers, um, then it's really not the best one for you, I guess. Um, you know. Yes. I mean, in the end, it's always going to be a word of mouth thing. That there will come a point where you might be able to kind of initiate a fire via Goodreads or Twitter or whatever. But in the end, it's going to come from readers talking to friends about a book that they've recently enjoyed. And you, you know, you you might be able to take sales from let's say two or three a day to 20 or 30 a day or even 30 or 40 a day by really pushing the marketing routes that you have but to achieve sales beyond that point you've actually just got to get a community of people going hey this book is great and they're talking about it with their friends and their book groups and you know that's how any viral sensation whether it's traditionally published or conventionally published how that actually makes it yeah no I think you're right uh, just uh, I'm interested in knowing what your uh, pricing strategy or what your thoughts are around pricing um, once you're able to distribute your own books and your own material, in terms of um, um, what 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 do you think what what will your approach be to that? Well, I'm I'm still feeling it out um, because I'm definitely writing series crime. So if people like the Fiona Griffiths books and and they do, I'm getting kind of incredible feedback on them. Um, I'm hoping that if they enjoy the book that I've just released, they'll want to read the next one. Um, and the one after that, and the one after that. So my game has got to be a long game. Um, I'm happy to price the first book cheaply in order to get readers to collect email addresses uh, and basically draw people into the series. So my first book, I'll expect to price it relatively cheaply, let's say between $2.99 and $4.99 but with relatively frequent price promotions, they will drop that all the way down to 99 cents, for example. Um, with subsequent books in the series, I may do occasional price promotions there too, but th those will be th th the boys that actually have to generate money. Um, and so there, I would expect to be pricing at a pretty stable 4.99 probably. Yeah, no. Oh, that's great. It's really um, fascinating to talk to you, and um, I wish you all the best. Uh, uh, with your latest book and we're going to be posting this on the Readsy blog and I think it'll be great uh, for so many of our readers um, just to hear about uh, your journey through to self-publishing and, and yeah hybrid exactly I mean and, and I think there's you know to, just to end on on a kind of note that I think will be positive both for you and, and your and, and your community which is th there is still a perception of self-publishing as a kind of you know, but I wasn't good enough for traditional publishing, so I'm self-publishing. And that perception has certainly changed, but it's still there. There's, there's no question it's still there. I mean, I, I am a conventionally published author, and I've had some terrific book reviews, and I'm self-publishing because I want to. And for me, it's not. It really isn't a, because I couldn't cut it with the big boys um, type solution. It's a, actually, I wasn't prepared to take what the big boys were offering me. I didn't want it. I preferred the, the risks and the rewards and the opportunities of self-publishing to, you know, working with what is the world's biggest publisher. Um, and 
you know, I, I'm definitely hedge my backs because I've still conventionally published here in the UK. But I, I, I love this model of being a hybrid author. And, you know, I think people will go both ways as well. I think successful self-pub authors will become hybrids in the other direction. Yeah. But I do think it's a new world we're now living in. Yeah, it's very, very interesting and extremely exciting. I think that's a very, very inspiring message uh, to pass on to our, to our readers. So thank you so much. Thank you. Best of luck with it, and uh, yes, I'm sure we'll we'll be hearing much more of you in the future. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. Yeah.